This is 7 News. Tonight, Perth set to get Sunday trading within months. Graffiti vandals caught in the act. Help Perth police round them up. Commuter crush. Tonight, it's our southern suburbs. 20 kilometres an hour now. Car versus bike. And a seven exclusive, Frio's Hayden Ballantyne. What he thinks of his new coach. From the studios of Seven Perth, Susanna Carr and Rick Arden. Good evening. Perth is set to get Sunday trading within months. New laws introduced in Parliament today will mean any shop will be able to open on a Sunday between 11am and 5pm. Jeff Parry reports. We've bickered and fought over Sunday trading for years. Colin Barnett once opposed it, so did Mark McGowan. In 2005, we had a referendum and voted against it. But in August, Sunday trading will be here to stay. There'll be a, a great sense of relief across Perth that people will finally have the right to go shopping on a Sunday. Well, between 11 in the morning and 5 in the evening at least, the government has balked at removing all shopping restrictions. It's the biggest change to retail trading hours we've seen in many, many years, and it's part of a program of incremental change that this government's been pursuing. For some retailers who haven't previously been able to trade on Sundays, the changes are good, but not good enough. There are still anomalies. Hardware retailer Bunnings can trade Sundays between 7am and 7pm. Its newest competitor, Masters, will be restricted to 11 to 5 because it also sells fridges and washing machines. What WA Business really wants is full deregulation. So at the end of the day, shopkeepers can open whenever they want and shoppers can go and buy whatever they want, whenever they want. Until now, Sunday trading was blocked by the Liberals' partner in government, the Nationals, who had unlimited trading in the country but opposed it in the city. Now, with new Labor leader Mark McGowan pledging to support Sunday trading, the Nationals' vote is irrelevant. My view is let's just get on with it. Uh, let's get this issue over with. Jeff Parry, Seven News. Perth Police have released video of graffiti vandals in action, hoping Seven News viewers will be able to identify them. They can be seen on security video defacing buses, trains and public property. Grant Taylor reports. Young vandals caught red-handed defacing Perth's public transport, buses, trains, even inside a train station elevator. Take a look at his face. You might just know who this is. Police release these images today because they need your help to track these vandals down. Here a young man scrawls his name on the back of a bus seat. His face stays hidden until he makes the mistake of looking up at the camera. People of Perth, the message from me to you is get involved in this. Get on the phone, ring up, tell us who these offenders are and I can tell you that we will be out there knocking on their door tomorrow. This man thought he was smarter than the rest. He covered his face with a T-shirt as he vandalised a train, but the cameras got him as he was leaving the station. Then there's these young guys. They're doing their best not to let the driver see what they're doing, but the camera in the corner captures it all. All that's needed now are the names to go with these faces. Police are confident they'll all be identified from these photographs. The community of West Australia should not tolerate it. It might seem like child's play, but it's a $25 million problem. That's how much WA taxpayers and industry spend every year cleaning this sort of mess up. For the next fortnight, police are also running Operation Eraser, targeting well-known prolific vandals. This 21-year-old was already on bail, arrested again this morning for questioning about at least a dozen more offences. Grant Taylor's at Crime Stoppers headquarters. Grant, police are waiting for calls tonight. Well, Rick, there's actually been a lot of calls already after the uh, images ran on the front page of the West Australian this morning. And I can tell you some good news. There's actually been one arrest so far. Someone actually handed themselves in earlier today, but police still need more help. There are extra staff actually rostered on here at Crime Stoppers headquarters to take your calls. If you can... The number to ring is 1800 333 000. All calls are treated in confidence and rewards are available. So. Thanks, Grant. Aboriginal activists have set up their tents again at Harrison Island after a protest march through the city. Some of the activists delivered a letter to Government House outlining their anger over a $1 billion land rights deal. Alexis Donkin reports. Morning rush hour and protesters took to the city. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. 
A group of about 30 marched on the road. Young children holding banners wandering in the road. At times, traffic was forced to a standstill. Their purpose, to deliver a letter to the Governor of Western Australia. We look forward to hearing from you and we welcome you to visit the Nyunga Tent Embassy. Elders delivered the letter to an official under police watch. Officers were the target of abuse by some angry protesters. Children walking on the roads and we're concerned for your... I am there, father. We're more concerned. We're there, you think that we won't protect you our children? we're not going to protect our kids. What... The protesters are angry over the government's billion-dollar native title deal. They've been camping at Harrison Island near the causeway for over a week, ordered to take tents down on Sunday. Today, they were back up. An end to the stalemate could still be a long way away. The protesters say every time their tents are taken down, they'll put them back up, vowing to stay put. Yeah. We're not nowhere and they need, we're not going anywhere. They need to recognise. And Alexis Donkin is at Harrison Island tonight. Alexis, what are the protesters' plans now? Rick, good evening. Well, they're simply saying to me that they're here to stay and police are saying that they won't intervene like they did on Sunday unless they're called in by the City of Perth. But the City isn't saying what their next move will be, but the Premier is on record saying that the tent embassy must go. So we'll just wait to see what happens next. Sue. Thanks, Alexis. A worker has died after falling nine metres from a cherry picker in South Perth. It happened at an exclusive riverfront apartment complex. The 47-year-old was one of two men lopping a tree when part of the cherry picker snapped. Nine metres. That's how far the two workers fell when the metal arm on their cherry picker snapped. One of the men, a 47-year-old, was critically injured. Workmates tried to revive him, but he died at the scene. His colleague survived with just a sore back. The two men were tree lopping just before 8 o'clock this morning at the exclusive Clifftop Apartments on Mill Point Road. Residents who witnessed the worker's death and the unsuccessful attempt to save him were left horrified. WorkSafe has offered its condolences to the tree lopper's family and colleagues. It says today's accident here in South Perth brings the number of workplace deaths in Western Australia over the past financial year to 13. WorkSafe is now trying to confirm why the metal arm snapped. The construction union has issued a safety alert asking members to check similar machinery. David Cooper, 7 News. An inquiry into sex abuse at the Katanning Hostel has heard how boys were publicly humiliated, forced to watch porn and shower naked in front of Dennis McKenna, who was the warden there. The inquiry before former Justice Peter Blacksaw is determining the extent of abuse at the Katanning Hostel and whether there was a cover-up in the 1970s and 80s that allowed it to continue. We were just too scared. All the boys were too scared. Everyone was scared of him. He was just a, um, just a, a tall poppy and... No one would question his authority. Dennis McKenna is in jail serving time for child sex offences committed at Katanning. The public inquiry will continue on Thursday. We're taking another look tonight at just how busy it's getting on Perth roads at peak hour. Last night it was the northern suburbs where the train proved much quicker than the car. Now we turn our attention to the southern suburbs, the West Australians Gary Adshead and Grant Taylor, and this time car versus bike. We're about to hit the uh, southern freeway, if you like, the Kunana Freeway slog into the heart of the city to see what the traffic's like. You on a bike, me in a car, four wheels versus two. Good luck, mate. I'm off. See you later. While I start pumping up a sweat, Gary glides away in air-conditioned comfort. Only to find the freeway is more like a car park. The train looks good. The train looks like a very good option. Roadworks on the Quinana make the going slow. For me too. Bit of a detour, this could make things interesting. After the minute 6 PR Perth traffic. Northbound on the Quinana slow from Berrigan Drive through to South Street. I'm dropping down to 20 kilometres an hour now. And I'm on a 100 kilometre an hour freeway. A bobbing white helmet only sign Grant's not only keeping pace, but outpacing my car. There you go. He's up there on the, just his helmet. I can just see it going past that fence. Uh, it's 7.47 and I've just hit Bull Creek train station. Back on the bike path, a steady 35 k's an hour, cruising speed. Really good, getting some exercise. But not so much fun in a car. The busiest hour on the Quinana, the same as the Mitchell, is between 6 and 7 a.m. 
Imagine doing this every day. Yeah, no, I couldn't do it. Gary, how are you going, mate? Oh, it's just great fun. I mean, honestly, we've been averaging about 5 to 15, 20 kilometres an hour. We've just hit the Mount Henry Bridge. Oh, just underneath the Mount Henry. Just stop to give you a call. I'm going to get going again. By 28 minutes, it's Canning Bridge. Traffic's 10 kilometres an hour, and the city is still 8 kilometres away. I've reached another bridge, the Narrows. Main Roads predicts traffic on our freeways will increase by as much as 50% within 10 years. Friday's the busiest day for our roads and our trains. Car's coming on. I'm still on the freeway at South Perth. The pace is picking up. Hold on tight. Oh, look out, I'm hitting 50. Oh, I'm here and there's no sign of Gary. Even cheating, he was supposed to park at a car park, not a clearway. Gary still arrives three minutes later. Surprise! <laughs> well done. There you go. I knew you'd do it. You're not far behind me. Oh, come on. A couple you of stopped, minutes. You Seriously. stopped twice to make telephone calls. Oh, well, I mean, I think you were... Time maybe, but you're not far behind me. Yeah, well, anyway, I would, your experience was probably more pleasant. Yes or no? Yeah, very enjoyable. From Farrington Road by car, 40 minutes and a fine for illegal parking. By bike, even stopping for phone calls, 37 minutes. Well done, mate. <laughs> All right, see ya. See ya. <laughs> and we've shown our reports on Perth's commuter crush to Transport Minister Troy Buswell. Tomorrow night in 7 News, hear his plans to cope with Perth's congestion nightmare. Still to come tonight, surgery for the Perth woman set on fire in a Rivervale unit. And a miracle escape from a US avalanche. In Sevens Money Watch, Australian shares recorded a third day of gains today. The ASX 200 closed 35 points up as investors reacted to news that European leaders have settled on a rescue plan for Greece. Materials the strongest sector, adding 139 points to the board. Gold was up more than $15 an ounce. The top end of our market reacted positively to the overseas news. BHP Billiton climbed 42 cents and rival Rio Tinto gained $1.12 to $69.16. Major banks also strengthened with the national leading the big four higher, up 22 cents or nearly 1%. The Commonwealth clawed back Monday's fall, finishing 37 cents higher. One Australian dollar is buying $1.07 US cents. A woman who was caught in a fire running in a Kimberley marathon wants a government inquiry into what went wrong. Kate Sanderson suffered horrific burns. She left hospital today after almost six months of treatment. Shadow Tourism Minister Michelle Roberts and Kate Sanderson's brother Ian held a news conference at Parliament today pushing for a government inquiry. Having spoken to her and having spoken to Ian, I think they deserve some answers. I have to do this for my sister and for the others. Late this afternoon, the government announced they will consider referring the matter to a parliamentary committee. Surgeons have carried out what will be the first of many skin graft operations on Dana Vulin, the young Perth woman who was set on fire in her Rivervale unit. They operated this morning after she was too unwell for the procedure yesterday. She's still in a critical condition in Royal Perth Hospital, battling burns to 60% of her body. Police are yet to lay any charges after someone poured methylated spirits over the 25-year-old and set her alight. Julia Gillard's supporters have dared Kevin Rudd to launch a challenge next Tuesday when Labor MPs meet in Canberra. They're confident she easily has the numbers to defeat him, with one MP even prepared to show his support for the Prime Minister with a tattoo. At a school in Western Sydney, the students show Julia Gillard how they play the numbers game. What's it called? Number busting. Number busting. They're busting there, numbers. Like there you go. As another number busts her way, marginal seat holder David Bradbury, happy to be marked as a Gillard supporter permanently. If it means getting a tattoo, I'd consider it. <laughs> But somehow I think my wife might object to that. <laughs> While fellow backbencher Bernie Ripoll voiced his own objections, taking direct aim at his former Canberra flatmate, Kevin Rudd. If somebody, anybody, is not a happy little Vegemite, they ought to go find something else to do. As more ministers call for an end to the instability. Sort things out and get on with the business of government. It does need to be resolved. Uh, no one uh, believes otherwise. I can reveal Julia Gillard's chief supporters issued a direct challenge to Kevin Rudd today to call for a leadership spill at next Tuesday's Labor caucus meeting, promising he would get one and be crushed. 
Giving the impression of business as usual, Mr Rudd met US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in Mexico. Our cameras weren't allowed in, but he posted his own video on Facebook, ensuring he was seen, if not heard. Mark Riley, 7 News. Four skiers have been killed in two avalanches in the American state of Washington. Three men were buried by a wall of snow and couldn't be revived after rescuers dug them out. Professional skier Elise Saugstad was also caught but survived. It feels like you're in like a, a washing machine and you're being flipped and tumbled and it's white the entire way. She says an avalanche airbag like this one saved her life. It inflated and kept her near the surface of the snow. Keen photographers have captured a rare sight at sunset in America's Yosemite National Park. Once a year at Horsetail Fall, the sun aligns with the water and the land to create a glowing spectacle. Like them, blink and you'll miss it. Basil's here with Sport Now. Ricky Ponting's batting on Baz. It was a bit of a strange day, Rick. Yes, everybody was waiting for a big announcement. It didn't come. The former captain pulls a crowd but makes no declaration. And on the road with the Dockers, Ryan Daniels goes one-on-one -on -one with Hayden Ballantyne. Hello, Natalia Cooper with you. Another very hot day in Perth. It is cooling off a little tomorrow, but it won't feel much cooler because it's going to be quite humid. Currently in the city, it's 28 and a half. Humidity 53%. Winds are from the southwest at 20 kilometres an hour. It was an uncomfortable night in Perth. Our minimum was 23.7 and that's five and a half degrees above the February average. 36 and a half was our top today. We got there just before midday. Around the metro area, it was cooler on the coast today. Lancelin with 31. Andra 32 and 37 degrees out at Jinjin. Around WA there was heavy rain in the north and through parts of the wheat belt overnight. Broome had the most 43 millimetres. There'll be more showers and storms in the north tonight. The Pilbara and Gascoyne could see some damaging winds as well. In the southern half tomorrow it's going to be humid down the west coast with some more hot temperatures in inland areas. Kalgoorlie going for a top of 37. If we have a look at the satellite, you'll see the activity in the north and through central parts of the state. It's been triggered by a trough which lies from the north to the south of the state. It's lying just inland from the west coast, so that's why there'll be cooler, humid conditions to the west of it tomorrow and hot weather to the east. Interstate tomorrow, a possible storm in Brisbane, a possible shower for Sydney and a sunny 28 29 for Adelaide. Boating information, southerly winds 15 to 20 knots, tending south to southwest 13 to 18 in the afternoon and easing to 8 to 13 knots by late evening. Seas to one and a half metres and swell to two metres. So a bit cooler tomorrow but humid, 33 the top after a low tonight of 22. Partly cloudy and 29 on Thursday. A morning shower on Friday, then fine and 26 on Saturday. Another shower is possible on Sunday and after that it's set to fine up again. And before I go, happy 70th wedding anniversaries to Doug and Vera Harrison and Hazel and Cyril Edmonds. Congratulations. That's all from me. Here's Oslato. That's 7 News for this Tuesday. Thanks for joining us. And now here's Monica. And today, tonight. Nobody.